you know, say if a guy fell onto uh, uh, you know, some skateboarder fell onto a, uh, tried to do a rail and fell and landed in his, striking his perineum here, ruptured blood vessels, those things are going to uh, you can track them all the way up into the abdomen. The bleeding can occur all the way up into the abdomen. Similarly, I think I gave the example of somebody getting hit right here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, you see a lot is, is seat belts in uh, motor vehicle collisions. You wind up with bruising across here and bruising across the shoulder. Uh, it can be pretty extensive, but this can track through those uh, fascial planes all in depth down into the perineum. All right, so uh, <coughs> there are different spaces in the perineum, and they don't really make much sense. Um, so you, you kind of have to follow me here a little bit. Uh, first of all, if we, here's the skin out of here. So here's the um, superficial fascia, this part right here. And then you've got the superficial fascia that's deep to that. Okay, so this is fat, there's your skin, superficial fascia. Deep to the superficial fascia is the superficial space right here. Now this picture is going to is taken from the urogenital triangle. So if we go back to the beginning here, it's taken up in here. Of course, this is the female, so uh, this is the plane. So you, when you watch, when you look at these coronal sections, you're going to see that they're different. Well, some of the sections are through the urogenital triangle, and some of them are through the anal triangle. And that's what, if you answer that question first, it will help you sort of put the pieces and parts together. All right, so this is through the urogenital triangle. Now, this is the superficial space. Here are the issue of tuberosities, here and here. It says issue of pubic ramus, but understand that that's the lower ramus. That's the lower ramus. That's what you're sitting on right there. In the male, hanging off or existing in the superficial space are the roots of the penis. Namely, this thing right here, this is called the bulb of the penis. And then, next to the issue of pubic ramus, out here on the laterally, there are other pieces of the um, penis that are going to form part of the erectile tissues. I'll go through the names of all these here in just a minute. In the female, it's, it's Almost the same, if you just take out this and put an opening for the vagina, you still have these two bodies off to the side, you still have the superficial space. So essentially, your external genitalia arise within the superficial space. And in fact, they hang off of or are, or are attached to a membrane called the perineal membrane. So the erectile tissues of the penis and the erectile tissues of the clitoris originate or hang or attach to the perineal membrane. Now if you look, that follow that blue line around, you see how it goes on to the top part there? That space right there where it says your genital diaphragm that space is called the deep space. That's the deep space within those two blue lines. The deep space contains the urogenital diaphragm. So if you were to take, when you remove <coughs> the skin today on the cadaver, and you're looking at, let's say it's a male, you're looking at the bulb of the penis, the two uh, crura out here laterally. <clears throat> if you put your finger between the two, you're going to put it, you're going to be putting it on the perineal membrane. 
you're going to be poking right there. Note that on the other side of that perineal membrane is the urogenital diaphragm. Okay? Now, the other side of the urogenital diaphragm, up here, you see there's our pelvic diaphragm right there. With the prostate sitting on top of it and the bladder on top of that. And the female, the bladder is going to sit right here. <coughs> Up in here is going to be the peritoneal cavity. You're right, we're in the pelvis, which is continuous with the peritoneal cavity. Right? Now, this little triangle right here, you see that nerve artery vein? Those are the pudendals, the pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal artery and vein. You find them running in a canal that's formed by the fascia of the obturator internus muscle. I'll show you other pictures of it here in just a minute. Makes more sense. Remember, this is the obturator internus right here. <clears throat> Remember the pelvic diaphragm arises from the fascia of the obturator internus? Okay. If I travel backwards into the plane of the board, you're going to wind up back here in the anal fossa. I'll show you in a minute how that works. The anal fossa, the anal fossa continues forward like a U. I can illustrate it right back here. If we put the urogenital diaphragm in place here, remember the pelvic diaphragm sitting on top of it, right? So if we have envisioned this triangle as the urogenital diaphragm, if I'm back here in this fat, I can push my fingers forward deep to the urogenital triangle, or between the urogenital triangle and the pelvic diaphragm. You follow me on that? Anybody, anybody confused about where we are on that? <clears throat> okay, so think of this triangle here as the urogenital diaphragm. Remember I showed you a picture the other day of the diaphragm. So there's two layers. There's the, there's the pelvic diaphragm and then the urogenital diaphragm. So in this illustration right here, there is no UG diaphragm. But we're going to call this we're going to put a muscle right here and call that the UG diaphragm. I could take my fingers like that, and back here where your rectum is, I can put my fingers on either side of the rectum and pass them underneath that muscle and over top of the pelvic diaphragm. There's a space there. Now, does that make sense? Okay. You'll see the pictures later on. But I want to make that point, because this is very important. If you go messing around with abscesses back here, those abscesses can extend all the way forwards in this space right here into the front, where you'll never reach them. That space back there where your anus is, is called the ischio anal fossa. And that's what that wording means in green there. It's the anterior recess. It's extensive. Okay. So here's the superficial space. There's the deep space. <coughs> the male external genitalia, the erectile tissue, has some pretty screwy names. First, there is the 
erectile tissue itself. And this is a sinus, um, like a sponge. It looks like a sponge. The sponge here, where your urethra is, is called the corpus spongiosum. The sponge out here laterally, on both sides, is called the corpus cavernosum. <coughs> you have two corpora cavernosa and one spongiosum. Now each of these, each of these three things is surrounded by a flat muscle. And when that blood-filled sponge gets backed up, those muscles contract to force erection downstream. Same thing happens with the clitoris. Those two muscles, the one around the corpus spongiosum, is called the bulbo spongiosus muscle. You can remember that because this thing right here is called the bulb of the penis. The bulb of the penis. Bulbo spongiosus is the flat muscle around the corpus spongiosus. The muscle around the corpus cavernosum is called the ischiocavernosus muscle. We have two ischiocavernosus muscles and one bulbo spongiosus muscle. When you, I don't know if you can do it on the cadavers, but everybody uh, go over to the male cadavers. Or, if you take your, so you have the scrotum there. The scrotum is hanging off here. If you take your hand and put on sort of either side of the, the back of the scrotum and feel up in there, you'll feel that large bulb of the penis. It's much easier to do it on a live person. But you'll see that the shaft of the penis is a certain length, but then there's the bulb of the penis that's here in the superficial space. And it's quite impressive. Uh, so, Paul said he would. Um, <coughs> so, in females, you have, the, I said that you have the same thing out here. You have the ischiocavernosus muscles in females surrounding the corpus cavernosa, and those are going to give rise to the erectile parts of the clitoris. The bulb of the penis, though, is a little different. Um, it's divided and there's half of it in each labia majora. So you have a bulbospongiosus muscle in the labia majora surrounding a corpora spongiosus. This is in the labia majora. Now, I'll, I'll emphasize to you again, these are estrogen-dependent tissues in the female. So you're not going to find um, it's very difficult to find a bulbospongiosus muscle in the erectile tissues in the female. They're much smaller because of the postmenopausal issue. Then I, they're on either side of the um, introitus to the vagina. <coughs> but otherwise, you know, everything else is pretty much the same. There's our pudendal canal. There's the anterior recess, the superficial space the same, the deep space is the same. <laughs> this is what it looks like. Here's the, uh, well let's take the bulbospongiosis muscle here, is around the corpus spongiosum. Here is the corpora cavernosum, and you can see the muscle fibers around it. That's the ischiocavernosus. 
they, those three elements go to form the penile shaft. Over here on the female side, here's our UG diagram. There's the bulbospongiosis muscle. There's the ischiocavernosis muscle. That thing right there is the perineal membrane. Right there is the perineal membrane. Now there's one muscle you probably won't find, and that's that one right there. It's called the superficial transverse perineus muscle. It runs from the perineal body, which is the point between the back of the uh, of penis and the anus, or the back of the <laughs> vagina and the anus, that's the perineal body, to the issue of tuberosity. That muscle is really superficial. It's like a facial muscle, you know, it's really superficial. If it's gone, don't worry about it. The important muscle in this region, though, is what's underneath the perineal membrane, the muscle of the deep space. And that muscle is called the deep transverse perineus muscle. Deep transverse perineus muscle. Another muscle that's in that deep space. If this is the uh, deep transverse perineus muscle, right there. Muscle fibers are going this way. This is a male. The urethra is there. If it's a female, you have to throw in the vagina. But. There's another muscle right here that goes around the urethra. It's called the sphincter urethrae. It's under somatic control. That is your external urethral sphincter. You've heard of uh, Kegel exercises after pregnancy or with incontinence. And it's basically just a matter of sitting here <coughs> and contracting your junk to, to work out your muscles in this region. What you're doing is you're trying to work out your UG diaphragm and your pelvic diaphragm to help support the, the pelvic organs <coughs> to prolapse the, uh, to help with incontinence, reduce the, the degree of incontinence. Kegel exercise, K-E-G-L-E. -E. This right here is the gluteus maximus we're going to take off today. You can see the sacrotuberous ligament right there. You'll see it better when we remove the, the muscle. All right, so this is how they come together. Um, on the, on the male side here, we have the bulb, we have the ischial cavernosis. They come together to form the shaft of the penis. There's, there's two bodies on the top and one, bottom, one body on the bottom. And the one on the bottom contains the urethra, the spongiosa. In females, the bulbospongiosis doesn't play a a role really in the clitoris, in the formation of the clitoris. The clitoris is more <coughs> like formed just, the, just from the two uh, ischio cavernosis or the uh, corpus cavernosa. Right here and right there. You see, they come up and over and form the clitoris. In females, in the labia majora, where you would see the bulbospongiosis, there's a, there's a gland in there. It's called Bartholin's gland, or the greater vestibular gland. Everybody in medicine calls it the Bartholin's gland. Um, Bartholin's glands, because the opening of this gland is into the vagina right there, at the uh, entrails, um, they can get infected. And when you wind up with an infected Bartholin's glands, those things can get really large, 
really painful, really hot, really full of pus. Um, it, it's amazing. And to, to drain them, uh, all you do really is do a little ethyl chloride right here on the inside of the vagina, just, just inside. You don't need to go in, into it, but just move the, move it to the minor apart just a little bit. Ethyl chloride, the, the vagina there, and you just take a scalpel and stab it, and it just explodes with pus. It's amazing how big these things can get. Does that have um, a like, tendency to reoccur? They can reoccur, you know, especially uh, people with diabetic, uh, people who are diabetics, or people who have problems with MRSA. They're always MRSA. It's just like a, it's just like a fur uncle. You know, people, some people are more prone to them. Um, but I, I did, a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe a couple of months ago now, the nurse practitioner, Good Shepherd, she came out and said, "Dan, can you go look at this woman? Um, she's got a." in her leg of a jaw. So I'd go in there and get a huge sparkle and cyst and you could press on it a little bit and pus was coming out the orifice of the Bartholin's gland and I so much wanted to stab that thing. But with this type of process, unless you're going to be able to follow them, uh, you really should not do that. Um, so we sent her to the emergency room uh, where they would where they would treat her in the emergency room and then refer her to the uh, GYN residency clinic. You really need to follow that. You don't, you know, a once a week clinic should not be stabbing Bartholin's glands. So, oh, I wanted to so bad. But I just knew that thing was going to explode. And you know, they'll think you're, the, you're, they'll think you're uh, Buddha or Jesus or Muhammad or uh, Abraham. Because it's instant relief. They're very painful. And they're usually unilateral. They're not bilateral. They're usually unilateral. Uh, the other thing is when somebody starts to get one, if you tell them to sit in a hot bathtub uh, with a little Epsom salt uh, dissolved in it uh, two or three times a day, a lot of times it'll come to the surface and pop on its own. And you don't have to stab it. But uh, Bartholin's gland cyst or abscesses, you'll see those a lot. Any questions about the anatomy? So muscles of the deep space, uh, sphincter urethrae is what I mentioned. The deep transverse perineus or perineal muscle is the UG diaphragm. <clears throat> Now there's a defect anterior. The diaphragm doesn't, if you have the, uh, you know, the issue of pubic ramus comes up to the pubic bone here, the UG diaphragm does not cover it all the way to the pubic synthesis. There's a little space there, a little gap. That gap allows for the transmission of uh, nerves and arteries <coughs> to get out onto the penis or to the clitoris. I'll show you that pathway here in just a little bit. Okay. So if we look at the, the female here, just to put it all in perspective, when you um, remove the skin, this is what you're going to be looking at today. You, again, you might not find the superficial transverse cranius muscle, but you can easily find and by the way, these things are often called crura, C-R-U-R-A, crura. If you call it a cruz, C-R-U-S, which is singular, I'm going to give it to you. Okay. But understand that it's the corpus cavernosus, the spongy tissue, the erectile tissue, with the ischial cavernosus muscle outside of it. But if I tag that on the practical, if you just say cruz, you got it. Because clinically, that's really how it's known. When you remove the skin of the labia majora, <coughs> you may see uh, the fibers there of the bolo spongiosis. 
Now, for those that aren't that familiar with female anatomy, <coughs> anterior to posterior, you have the clitoris. Behind that is the urethra. Behind that is the opening of the vagina. Then you have the perineal body, and then you have the anus. And some women, because of how the urethra and the vagina form, remember when I was showing you that embryology used to be like a bird, it used to have just one opening, and then it got uh, walled off into the, ur the urinary system and the genital system in the adult. Well, in some women, um, the urethra, when you go to put a catheter in, and you open the labia minora, right? Labia majora is out here. Labia minora is inside. When you go to open the labia minora to look for it, it ain't there. Where did it go? <laughs> Where you look for it is if this is the vagina. If you're looking at it, and this is the vagina. And there's the clitoris. And there's nothing in between it. It's just flat skin. Why are you covering your nose? I'm nervous for what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to catheterize them, like take a Foley catheter, the opening of the urethra will be on the anterior vaginal wall. So what you do is you take the catheter, you hold it in your hand like this, and hold the tip so it comes up off your finger like that. And you just slide your finger in the vagina with that catheter facing the anterior vaginal wall and you'll find it, boop, it'll go inside the urethra. It's, it's, it's an anomaly, but I've seen it five or six times. Um, I just saw it a few months ago, as a matter of fact. I go to quick cath the woman, which is a, a quick cath is, if you're on your period, if you're, like now, if you're on your period, but I need to get a urinalysis from you, and I don't need it contaminated with menstrual blood, then I'm going to catch it. Well, the, the nurse was the patient's sister, so she was going to let her sister cath her, so she said, you do it. So I go in there, and no urethra. So I have to go searching inside the vagina, but always know this, where it's going to be is on the anterior vaginal wall. You can't put a speculum in there and look for it, because the speculum will get in your way. You just have to put it on your finger and just, you know, with a little bit of it hanging off the end, just kind of run it in there. When it finds the urethra, it'll go up into the urethra and you just thread it on in. Okay? So if we look at the male here for a second, now we're looking from above. All, all the time we've been looking from below like this. We're going to look from above here. Here are the two ischio cavernosa or crura. They come together right here to form part of the shaft of the penis. The bulb, as, as I said a few minutes ago, was the bottom third. And it's going to go out here. And this is the corpus spongiosum. The corpus means penis, essentially, or clitoris. The corpus spongiosum or the corpus cavernosum means that part that's on the penis or clitoris. The vascular structures of here, of this region, and by the way, erection of the clitoris or penis is not due to an increase in arterial blood flow to the organ, it's due to a decrease in venous drainage from the organ. That's what that's how engorgement works here. The main vascular structures of the penis, and there's the same for the clitoris, you're just not going to find them is on the dorsal surface of the penis, 
in the midline is a venous structure called the deep uh, vein, deep dorsal vein of the penis. That drains the penis through that gap in the UG diaphragm under the pubic bone into a plexus of veins around the prostate. It's called the puboprostatic plexus. From there, the venous blood is going to drain into the internal iliacs and part of the cable system. The same structure is in the clitoris, it's the deep dorsal vein of the clitoris. You have an artery on either side, and you have a nerve on either side of that. A dorsal artery and dorsal nerve of the penis and clitoris. These nerves are contain both autonomics and somatics. This is sensation to your external genitalia, and it's coming from the pudendal nerve. It's the termination of the pudendal nerve. Dorsal nerve of the penis, dorsal nerve of the clitoris, is the termination of the pudendal nerve. All right, so let's go to the anal triangle for a second here. Focus on the anal triangle. Um, the structures that you're going to see here, we've been over these structures. Here's the external and internal anal sphincter. That's the internal, that's the external. There's the pelvic diaphragm, or the levator ani. The levator ani is made up of what two muscles? Pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus. Okay. We have columns and we have valves. There's a structure called the pectinate line at the bottom of the um, col columns and valves. That's the transition between autonomic and somatic. There's another structure here called the white line. That's the difference between keratinized skin and non-keratinized skin, but it's still somatic. Everything both superficial to the pectinate line is somatic. You can feel it. Here's the sling that I told you about the other day. You know what I forgot to tell you guys about? For my 18th wedding anniversary, back in, uh, I, I got my wife the, the gift of all gifts, Squatty Potty. <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Squatty Potty. You know what Squatty Potty is? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, $20 online. Look it up. There's a unicorn taking a poop using a squat. You got one at home? <laughs> yeah, who said that? It worked, doesn't it? I mean, I've never used it, but man, I'll tell you what, she 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 gave me a hard time about we've been married 18 years. You give me a piece of plastic that I shit with. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out I think she'd rather do without me than her squatty pot. <laughs> You need to look at the little advertisement. Because what they, what, no, you don't need to do it. You don't need to do it. Here way she's doing it. What it's, what it's supposed to do is straighten out this angle. And if you have a problem with, uh, like, um, irritable bowel disease, with constipation as the prevalent form of the disease, it helps straighten out your colon so you can poop easier. I'm not making this up. Do, Watch the YouTube video right there. Ridiculous. Watch the YouTube video. No, you try it. There we go. She's all over. Is that the video with the unicorn? Yeah. Bamboo one. So weird. There's a really classy bamboo one. There's a bamboo one. Yeah, it's really pretty. You should get her one of those. I'll get one of those. We're going to 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 get one of those. So, okay, so this is 
uh, the film we're going to be looking for today, uh, we're going to remove the gluteus uh, uh, to expose more of this uh, structure. So the pudendals, I've talked about the pudendals, and when I say pudendals, I mean pudendal nerve and internal pudendal artery vein. I'm just going to brevity say pudendals. If you want to write pudendal, if I say identify this artery and you say pudendal, I'm going to give you full credit, okay? We're just going to call it pudendals. Um, so they come out, like every, most everything else, that the operators come out the greater side of the foramen, turn and go to the lesser side of the foramen. I mentioned that yesterday. So when they come through the lesser side of the foramen, they're headed towards the front. So these are the pudendals right here. Now, they're going to, as they move forward or anteriorly, they're going to give off these branches over here to the, um, to the anus to the external anal sphincter. Remember I said that the inferior rectals came off of the pudendals. That's where they come off of there. The middle rectals come off of the internal iliac. The superior rectals come off of the inferior mesenteric. So these three rectal branches come off of three different vascular structures, okay? So, the pudendal nerves are, so sensation of the anus is through the pudendals. Not the autonomics, not the defecation of the autonomics, sensation. So external hemorrhoids, that painful sensation is being carried over the, the pudendals, okay? Now as they continue forward, they change names. Uh, there's a superficial perineal, a deep perineal. The superficial perineal is going to supply the uh, scrotum and the bulb of the penis or the labia majora. The deep, trans, the deep perineal nerves and arteries and veins, they go deep to the UG diaphragm. They're going to enter that pudendal canal. Remember from early on, that pudendal canal was, that section was through the UG triangle. So these things are going to enter the pudendal canal. The, these are the superficial ones. The deep ones are going to enter the pudendal canal. And you'll see them. Let me go all the way back because I want to make sure this points. I understand them. They're right there. They're deep to the deep transverse perineus muscle. Follow me? And what they do is they're going to go, they're going to continue forward and then come out as the dorsal nerve of the penis occurs. They just follow that obturator internist upward. They come through that defect in the UG diaphragm to become the dorsal nerve of the clitoris or penis. Here it is again. There's the pudendals going out. You remember, pudendal is S234. Going out the greater side of the foramen, coming in through the lesser side of the foramen, which is formed by the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. There it is in the ischioanal fossa, where you can easily see it today. There's the superficial branches. The deep branches are in the pudendal canal. There's that defect, there's your pubic bone, there's the defect in the UG diaphragm, they pop out, boop, and the dorsal nerve of the penis or clitoris. Easy. Huh? When it pops out. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's called. <laughs> These are all somatic sensory. Somatic sensory. So you touch your uh, around your in your perianal region, your perineum, your scrotum, scrotum, <laughs> your, your labia majora, your penis clitoris. It's all pudendal nerve. If you're a paraplegic, then you cannot transmit that touch sensation 
to the CNS where you can interpret it. Now here's the thing. This has nothing to do, well, it has something to do. I was going to say it has nothing to do with erection. It certainly does because stimulating the sensory, the somatic sensory part you know will cause erection. Right? But you can have an erection without any stimulation of the pudendal nerve. You know? um, that is all autonomics. So parasympathetics, you remember that, that first day I said parasympathetics cause erection. Sympathetics cause ejaculation. Understand that a paraplegic can get an erection and ejaculate. The only thing they can't do is feel somatic sensation. You don't believe me? I believe I don't believe you. So I mean <laughs> para paraplegics can can have babies. Paraplegics can uh, you can a paraplegic man can get a paraplegic woman pregnant. Well, that was let me say, let me say that again. Let me let me revise that. You could you could, but you'd have to have help. I think. You might not. You might not think about it for a minute. <laughs> no, 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 no. Your patients will ask you this. Your patients will ask you this. You know, my, if, if a paraplegic man, I can promise you, the first thing he will ask you once he's recovered consciousness from this spinal cord injury is, can he have sex? I guarantee you the first thing he'll ask. Yeah, he's a man. He's a man. Yes. <laughs> And the answer is, yes, you can. Now, if, you're, if, the, if your partner is not uh, paraplegic, then he or she would be able to can do all the moving around. But still, you can get an erection. Okay. So how, I mean, normally, you know, I think you get to a certain point and then you ejaculate. So if he can't feel anything, what triggers ejaculation? It's all reflex. It's all reflex. You can't feel it. You, can't feel, you cannot feel the sensation of orgasm or ejaculation. So but it's all it's all autonomic. Even if he doesn't feel anything, See, you're, you're, at some point it's the, going to go. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so even if he can't feel anything, at some point it's like... We're you gotta done. get out of here. Yeah, we're done. It's time to go. <laughs> Remember, orgasm. I just really want to go down this route. <laughs> this, that, that, that is a somatic sensation. That is a somatic sensation. You have to stimulate the vagina or the clitoris or the. Uh, you have to ejaculate. You have to feel the sperm or the ejaculate going down the urethra, ping out of urethra, right? So if you can't somatically feel it, you don't, you don't know. But you can do it, you can ejaculate because the process is purely sympathetic. I'm going to take us on a different track real quick. So I thought your sympathetics and parasympathetics also came from S234. They, they, they do, but not uh, ventral primary rami. Uh, the pelvic splanchnics are branches off of the ventral primary rami. The pelvic splanchnics. Mm -hmm. The sacral splanchnics, I didn't mention the sacral splanchnics the other day, but they come off of the sympathetic chain. They're not associated with the cauda equina, uh, well, the parent, the pelvic blankets are. They run in the cauda equina, but they're not part of the pudendal nerve. Okay, this is a purely somatic nerve. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> 
Can a lady get pregnant? With Absolutely. Absolutely. Because pregnancy, she, her ability to feel down here has nothing to do with her menstrual cycle. It's all hormonal driven. So she ovulates, she menstruates just like, just like uh, uh, normal. So, yeah. You talked about all the different like pains in pregnancy and stuff. If you're a paraplegic, you wouldn't know if something was wrong. You couldn't feel it. Well, well, true. If, yeah, you wouldn't be able to, and you wouldn't need, if you were a paraplegic woman, you would not need a spinal or an epidural during delivery. You can't feel it. But you could still, your uterus would still contract and get the baby out. That's hormonal driven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now go ahead. You, you, you. I, was, I was just asking, so when they are in labor, how do they push if they don't have like that control of the muscles? Well, they can't push if they're quadriplegic, but if they're if they're uh, paraplegic, you still have your abdominal valsalva like that, and your diaphragm to push. Yeah, you can still generate pressure. And there's always oxytocin. Oxytocin is the hormone to induce labor and will cause the uterus to contract. Or if there's a problem, if there's going to be a problem, if they're quadriplegic, the C section. That's the way to go. Okay. Um, so here's from the inside, the inside of the pelvis. There's our operator. There's the pudendals going out, the greater sciatic gland, coming back through the lesser sciatic gland, <coughs> traveling in the pudendal canal. It's been opened up. There's the pubic ramus. Is coming out onto the penis or clitoris right there. Uh, let's take a break before we go on.